Hey guys, what's going on? I want to talk about blasphemy against the Holy Spirit today. So, as most of you are probably familiar with, God has three entities or three parts. Um, the Father, the Heavenly Father, the Creator of everything, the Eternal, that's the soul of God. Uh, the Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, through who all things are made and for who all things are made, uh, especially all things in this physical reality, they're, they're made through Jesus. Um, and then the Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of God, so soul, body, spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is God's Spirit, which is in this world, and it's it's moving through this world, and it's everyone can, well, most people can feel it, and we're going to get into this details of that, and uh, that's what this talk is going to be about. So, uh, the main Bible verse we're going to be looking at today is Matthew 12, verses 31 and 32, and this is talking about the unpardonable sin. And most people probably have not heard about this before. Um, Christianity is very much associated with forgiveness of sin. And, you know, people know that our God is merciful and forgiving. But that's not a blanket thing. There are some nuances and some specificities to that. Uh, and, in fact, there's only one exception, and that's what we're going to cover. So, the, the verses read, Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Now that's... That's a heavy and very final and definitive statement. It's making it very clear that this sin is unforgivable and it's eternal. And especially this part at the end here, either in this age or in the age to come, is very interesting. Now, I, I need to do a further analysis. You know, I need to go deeper into the book of Revelation and, uh, and kind of map out the different ages. But... This is suggesting, and even in, even in some uh, translations, it's it's called an eternal sin. Um, so this is pretty serious. This is really serious. Uh, and this is the only sin that will not be forgiven. So, okay. So, all sins are forgivable except blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So what is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? I've kind of established the seriousness of it. But now let's go into detail about what it is. So before, before I can kind of tie together what the blasphemy of the Spirit is, let's talk about what the Holy Spirit itself is. Um, the Holy Spirit is basically, it's God's Spirit, as I said. And Jesus compared it to the wind in John chapter 3. He, he compared being born of the Spirit to, to the wind a little bit. And... So the Holy Spirit is something that's sort of in the air, that's in the world. It's God's Spirit, and it's present in our world. And we can feel it and sense it like we can feel the wind, but but we can't see it, of course. Spirit is invisible. But we can sense it just like we can sense the wind. Like we, we can't control the wind. We can't really predict the wind. We can't, you know, say that the wind is going to blow this way at this time. But... When the wind does blow, you feel it. And it's the same with the Holy Spirit. Um, whenever you're seeing maybe a touching testimony about Jesus or you're listening to the Word of God or reading the Bible, sometimes you'll get this feeling of like this holy feeling a little bit and you'll you'll feel like the holy spirit that that's the holy spirit that you're feeling like it's god's spirit drawing you closer to him and to jesus uh, and you know the more you interact with god's word the bible the more you'll start to feel the holy spirit more and more pulling you closer and closer because god's one wants god wants everyone to come to him you know through jesus and he sent the holy spirit to help with that endeavor 
So most people, like, you know, when, when they go to church or when they read the Bible or even when they're alone and they're praying and they're reaching out to God, they'll feel some sort of feeling, special feeling that's that doesn't come with anything else. This feeling is like sort of a, a spiritual feeling. I, that's the perfect word for it. It's a spiritual feeling. And that's not our spirit that we're feeling. That's the Holy Spirit communing with our spirit. Our spirits are regular spirits and then god's spirit is the holy spirit and then when the holy spirit communes with us our spirit gets lifted and feels sort of it feels heightened by that connection to the holy spirit so most people are going to be able to recognize from that what the holy spirit is most people are going to be able to relate that description back to experiences they've had with spiritual experiences in their life but almost everyone has so that's the Holy Spirit, and we're, we're all born with the capability to feel the Holy Spirit and hear the Holy Spirit, and and you, you're you able to definitely feel the Spirit more clearly and hear what it wants you to do and hear what the Spirit is telling you more clearly as you get closer to God, but from birth, we're all capable of feeling the Holy Spirit. So what is blasphemy of the Spirit? Essentially, it is when someone rejects that feeling, rejects that spiritual feeling of the Holy Spirit tugging at their heart, pulling them closer to Jesus and to God. When you, when you cut it off, when you're like forcibly, it's almost like let's, you have ears so you can hear sounds. But if you cut off your ears or like destroyed even the inner mechanisms in your head that allow for audio perception, then you'd be deaf. You would not hear anything anymore. It's kind of like that. So your spirit inherently has a, a capability to receive and hear the Holy Spirit. But if you mutilate your own spirit, then you can no longer hear it. And that's what blasphemy against spirit is. That's why it's that serious. It's... There, you can't come back from that because, you know, your spirit is your spirit. You don't, you, there's, you can't get a new spirit on this earth. Um, well, you can't get a new spirit, period. Your spirit is your spirit, you know. So, if you do that to yourself, if you mutilate your spirit, to the point where you can't even hear the Holy Spirit, you can't even feel the Holy Spirit at all. Like, you literally lose the ability to get that spiritual feeling. And this is not just someone who's an atheist. Someone who's an atheist is someone who's just ignoring the Holy Spirit. They're not listening to it. This is someone who's actively, who's heard the Holy Spirit, who's felt its presence, and then be like, nope, I don't want this, I reject it. And literally, like, gone inside their own spirit and mutilated it. And it's, it's such an act of perversion against God that Jesus says whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit it will not be forgiven him and then that's what blasphemy of the Spirit is and that's there, there are more verses that talk about this but I, I'm just gonna kind of explain it in the way I understand it just in and I think that will be beneficial for people more so than just quoting all the different scripture So, that's what blasphemy of the Spirit is. It's turning off your ability in your spirit to receive the Holy Spirit, to let it guide you toward Jesus. And at that point, there's no more salvation. You, you've lost your compass to Jesus. Since Jesus is salvation, and if you lost your compass, you cannot find him. You're literally doomed to roam the earth until the end of your life, and then you die and you go to hell. Then you cannot be saved at that point. So how do we identify that someone has blasphemed the Holy Spirit. It's very simple. You you can observe their blasphemy of the Spirit in the way they they respond to the gospel, to the mes message of Jesus. Someone who is just simply ignoring the Holy Spirit and hasn't blasphemed against it they might be resistant to hearing about Jesus and they'd be like, oh, I don't care about this. I don't need Jesus. Jesus is 
Jesus is fake. Jesus is real. They, they might say all that. But again, Jesus said, anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven. So if that's all forgivable. Many people start out atheists and they ignore the Holy Spirit and then they eventually come to Jesus. But blasphemy of the Spirit is you hear the message of the gospel and you reject it actively with a hateful heart. You, you have vengeance in your heart. You've completely cut off your ability to even like see see the holiness of the message like even an atheist can listen to the message of jesus and be like okay this jesus guy was cool like most atheists will say jesus was a cool guy i don't believe he rose from the dead but he was a cool guy he preached something positive and that means they're still there's their spirit is still intact they haven't blasphemed against the spirit so they're, they're still okay they're still savable but someone who can hear the gospel and actively denounce it, actively reject the Holy Spirit pulling them closer to Jesus, th th they're too far gone. They're actually unsavable. And, you know, there's this um, pervasive idea that we have to try to save everyone and all that. But if you actually go into the Bible, that's just not the case. You're not... Christians, we're not supposed to waste our time trying to save people who are unsavable. Of course, we have to be careful in determining who has blasphemed against the Spirit and who hasn't. Um, but yeah, the, the, the scriptures do give us tools to do that. And now I, I want to move into an example of someone who has blasphemed the Holy Spirit and, and sort of what I view as evidence and proof that this person has blasphemed the Holy Spirit. So we're going to be looking at this text conversation between me and Seabass. And we'll start right here. Um, I go to him, and I have talked to him about Jesus before. This is not the beginning, and he, you know, so I'll give a little bit of the backstory. So in his server, he said to me. If you talk about Jesus in the server, I'll kick you out. So that's the first warning sign. Someone who has blasphemed the Holy Spirit, they're actively resisting the message. Not only like respectfully disagreeing, being like, hey, you believe in Jesus, you can talk about Jesus, that's cool. I have my beliefs. No, 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 they're not doing that. They, they don't want to hear it. They don't want it in their presence. Like they want to shut down the preaching of the gospel. That's only someone who has blasphemed against the Holy Spirit can do that. So he told me that I will be banned from his server if I mention Jesus. Okay, first warning sign, red flag. Then we go here. I, I, I talk to him here. I say, it's quite sad you are unsavable now because you have blasphemed the Holy Spirit. And I sent him this verse. Pouring one out for the dead homie who go into hell. And he goes, wrong. Then I say, are you denying it? You haven't blasphemed the Holy Spirit? I'm still giving him a chance to prove me wrong. Like, show me that you haven't. And he says, wrong. Then I say, because I have ways to test for it. He says, wrong. I say, it's all from the Bible. The Bible is wrong. He says, wrong. And you kind of get the idea. I'm trying to have a conversation with him about Jesus, about spirituality, about eternal life, about the gospel, which all Christians are called to do. If you are a true Christian... You must preach the gospel. It's 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 complete basic requirement. Preach the gospel to all who would hear. It's 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 a requirement. So I'm doing my duty here as a Christian to see bass. And sometimes when you do that, you f you hit someone who is just wrong, wrong, wrong. Don't want to hear it actively. Doesn't care. And that's when you know you've met someone who has blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. So I say this is a typical outcome of blasphemy of the Spirit. You've lost your ability to even hear the gospel. Satan fully owns you now. You're his bitch, which is true. And he's, he's a, he's a one-word, one-trick pony at this point. I say... Satan hoards you out to his demon friends every day and every night, and you signed your soul to him. He says, wrong. I say, go drink a six-pack, trying to forget the suffering. He says, wrong. Maybe blow some money on a sports bet, see if that can save you from Satan's torment. He says, wrong. 
I go, spoilers alert, spoiler alert, it won't. You know, he's repeating himself. He he has, he's incapable of even speaking at a spiritual level anymore. He can only speak in fleshly things. Alcohol, gambling. You know, and he'll, when, when you guys play IC with him, he'll have this wacky, crazy personality, making homosexual jokes, you know, disgusting sexual jokes. And he can do all that. He can do all those fleshly earths, er, er, things, but he's lost his ability to even speak at a spiritual level at all. He, it's, he's truly mutilated his spirit. That's what blasphemy of the spirit is, and that's why it's unforgivable. That's why it's such a serious sin in God's eyes. And yeah, um, not too much point into going into this whole conversation. It basically, the only word he says the whole time is wrong. That's he he he's incapable of uttering anything other than that. You know, I'm I'm trying to speak to him about Jesus and other things, and all he's able to say, yeah, he he's just incapable. Look at that. Like, imagine having a conversation with someone for like an hour. And so he's engaging in the conversation. He's he's not muting me. He's not blocking me. He's not unfriending me. He's engaging, but all but like he's only saying wrong. He's, it's crazy. It's actually crazy what he's become. Like he's truly like lost his humanity in a way. And I think that is actually factual because humans are made in the God, the image of God. In terms of we have a spirit soul and body and if you actually mutilate one part of that if you lose your spirit then you're no longer in the image of god so Sebas is literally no longer in the image of god anymore he was made in the image of god but he mutilated his spirit and that's why he's eternally separated from god and that's why the sin is eternal and but yeah um doing this literally turns into like a well you're you're no longer a human in the image of God with an intact spirit. You're a broken human with a broken spirit. And this is this type of breakage cannot be repaired. Jesus himself said he can't forgive this. Jesus, he's the great healer. He's the great savior. He can heal you from all sin. But he said, this one sin, it will not be forgiven. To see best truly is unsavable. And I believe his response to the gospel here is is proof of that and you know all of you are welcome to go test it um go te go speak to Sebas on spiritual topics and see what he has to say and he's not going to be able to say anything that's not like a woke buzzword type of canned response he has no he has no more spiritual opinions or spiritual senses at all. He's completely lost it. So yeah, that pretty much covers it. I believe that's conclusive evidence that Seabass has committed this uh, eternal sin, the unforgivable sin. And you all should really question playing games with him. Um, because it does say, let me pull up that verse really quick. Okay, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. And it says, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world, or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. So he's talking to the church here, and he's saying, when he's talking about not keeping company with sexually immoral people, he's not speaking generally when you're out in the world. He's talking specifically within your church, which you know, which means your social gatherings, your personal lives. So he's saying, but now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral, covetous, or an idolater, or reviler, or drunkard, or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. He's saying anyone who you know to be committing sin. You know, and he's specifically laying out these specific sins. But it, it can be generalized to all sin. Anyone who you know is actively committing sin, practicing sin, don't call them your brother. Don't be friends with them. Don't eat with them. Don't keep company with them. 
he's not saying to avoid all sinners in the world. Like we're supposed to go out, but within the context of your church and your social gatherings, you are not to keep company or call someone a brother who's actively practicing these sins. And of course, Seabass, he is a drunkard. He drinks himself to drunkenness almost, well, definitely every weekend, possibly every night. I don't know the details lately. He is a gambler. We know that. He's covetous. He's sexually immoral and homosexual jokes. And of course, so anyone who wants to call themselves a Christian really should not be playing games with Seabass because that's obviously that's, uh, you know, that's keeping company in a, in a more personal context than just interacting with him out in the world. And, and this is kind of separate with the concept of blasphemy against the spirit. But even if he hadn't committed blasphemy of the spirit, he should still be excluded from any Christian IC games. As he will be from mine. So anyway, that pretty much covers everything I want to talk about here. Uh, and look, it, it says clearly here, the title of this uh, passage here is Immorality Must Be Judged. People say the Bible forbids judging others, but that is not true. The Bible says, judge not lest ye be judged by the same measure. He's, so it means judge people when you yourself can withstand that same judgment you're handing out. So I can judge someone for being sexually immoral when I know that I I am good on that metric. Like I know I, I, I practice and I live in sexual morality. So then I can call someone a sexually, you know, sexually immoral. So the Bible tells us how to judge without being a hypocrite. But it doesn't actually say ever not to judge people for sins. And judging and condemnation is not the same. God is the one who will ultimately judge and con condemn them to hell. But on earth, we are to be aware of people's sins. We are to judge sins. We 100%, this is certain, this is uh, mentioned 200 times in the scriptures. Judging sins is extremely important. It's your duty as a Christian. And yeah, the scriptures speak for itself. And I urge all impossible creatures players who call themselves Christians to cut ties with sea bass. At the very least, test, try to understand what this blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is, and then test for yourself if sea bass is capable of receiving and hearing the Holy Spirit and come to your own conclusions. And even other than that, you know, he's definitely a drunkard. He's definitely a gambler. He's definitely sexually immoral. I urge you to cut ties today. Okay. Um, I'm going to end this sermon with a prayer. I think that will be beneficial. And I think the, the Lord is calling me to do that right now. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow him. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray to you in the name of Jesus to speak to all my fellow brothers and sisters who play impossible creatures, come to them in their hearts, show them the seriousness of sin, show them that your word is absolute, and you have given us these guidelines for sin and righteousness for our benefit. It's not to control us, to limit us, it's to free us, free us from the devil and his demonic influences. And give us a new eternal life free of sin, free from the law of sin and death. And this life that you have given us through, through sending your Son, through the sacrifice of Jesus, it's so beautiful and valuable. And I pray that you continue to work in their hearts and minds and draw them towards fulfillment of the reception of this promise of eternal life. Because this eternal life is offered to all whose spirits are intact and all who would hear the Holy Spirit. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will guide every single one, especially Petrify and Tofu, who I know are receptive to the message, message of Jesus. I urge them I urge you, God, to make them more receptive to the reality and the seriousness of sin. Because the understanding of the seriousness of sin is the first step towards repentance. 
There can be no repentance unless sin is taken seriously. We must, as as you say in your word of, in your word, God. We must hate what you hate, and you, God, hate sin. God did not design us to be sinners. God did not design us to live in sin, but you designed us to have eternal life, God. And Adam and Eve transgressed and let themselves fall into a sinful nature. But you in your eternal wisdom and glory have given us your son Jesus so that we may once again gain that gift of eternal life that Adam and Eve had in the beginning in the Garden of Eden. It's your will for all of us to ultimately live forever in a perfect place. And you have even been generous and kind to give us the exact specific paths to get there. And the path of repentance and trust in Jesus is the way to eternal life. And repentance starts with the understanding of the seriousness of sin. Thank you, God, for all of this understanding you have given us and the path to eternal salvation. And thank you as you work every day through your Holy Spirit and through Jesus himself calling people closer and closer to you. Amen.